John Markoff has been covering the bleeding edge of technoculture for the New York Times since before I can remember. He was certainly writing about cyberpunk as a real cultural phenomenon. And we're here to talk about his current release, What the Dormouse Said, How the 60s Counterculture Shaped the Personal Computer Industry. Welcome, John. Thank you. This book is a long time coming. Uh, there's been plenty of loose talk over the years about the links between uh, the PC, 60s styles, anti-authoritarianism, uh, and of course psychedelic drugs. Um, I was even myself principal person in a uh, piece in Esquire magazine about these links, but uh, nobody has traced it back to my knowledge as, uh, as deeply uh, as you did. Uh, you're the first person to really trace it back to its roots. Uh, please tell my listeners where your story begins. Well, actually, it begins in the late 1950s. Um, you know, I'm writing about the intersection of sort of two cultures around the Stanford campus. One was the counterculture, and then there was also a pretty active anti-war movement. Um, but uh, if you go back, um, both threads actually um, begin in the late 50s. If you go back, Stanford, uh, there was a pretty interesting um, sort of drug counterculture, but it was... Um, it was really small and it was very experimental and um, there was a group of people, uh, mostly technical, that sort of splintered off from a strange cult on the Stanford campus. Um, people uh, around a Stanford law professor who were studying the historical teachings of Jesus. And off of that came a, a small group of about six or seven couples who um, all began experimenting with psychedelic drugs in the late late 50s actually, after running into a man by the name of Captain Al Hubbard, who was sort of the Johnny Appleseed of LSD on the West Coast. Why that's important is it sort of served as an alternative vector of psychedelic drugs into the broader culture. I mean, most people know about uh, Ken Kesey and the Veterans mm -hmm. Hospital in Menlo Park, but this was a different, different avenue through which uh, the drugs came into the culture. But, you know, I was looking at that because there was this parallel, this really interesting parallelism between the work of a man by the name of Doug Engelbart, who was studying, he was attempting to build a machine that was, uh, his idea was augmenting uh, the human mind. And he was trying to do it with this device um, that was like uh, sort of a powerful mind expander, right. but a computer mind expander. And there was all this other experimentation going on right around Stanford in similar in a similar vein, maybe not with computers. People were experimenting with chemicals. They were exper experimenting with human growth te te right. you know, techniques. And it was all happening at the same time. So that's where I started. So it's all this uh, discussion or discourse or activity around uh, the idea of augmentation, basically, of expansion of uh, what is possible for human beings, whether through uh, uh, new technologies or through drugs or therapy and... Uh, this really leads perfectly into into another thought. I mean, there was this dialectic uh, that uh, appears at the beginning of your book, uh, a contrast between uh, those who see computers early on as a tool for uh, an expansive view of the human mind, as a tool for communication and community and so forth, and then there are the sort of the hard uh, artificial intelligence type. And it seems to mirror the struggle in the 60s between the establishment machine, this very sort of mechanistic view of uh, creating a new intelligence, uh, brain-like intelligence, but not giving this gift to uh, people in a, in a popular sense. And Doug, Doug Engelbert and some other people who are, who are uh, uh, working in a more, almost like a power to the people idea even before that slogan becomes popular in the, in the 60s. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at, at that from a couple of different angles. One is the sort of the changing view in the popular cu culture about computing just generally that happened between the late 50s and the, and the early 70s. I mean, the computer was really thought of as a big brother uh, tool uh, in the 50s. And uh, you remember the, the phrase, do not bend, fold, spindle, or mutilate. I right. mean, computers were really things that were held away from people that were in glass houses. And then in a decade, the, the attitude changed. And I think that's largely because of stuff that happened to right around Stanford. And to a large part, it came out of the philosophy and the resonance of the philosophy that Stuart Brand sort of promulgated through the whole Earth Catalog. I mean, he had this notion of how you could take tools that might be, uh, you know, used in, in systematically by the establishment. You could turn them around and you could use them for the community. 
And that really caught on and resonated with a whole large group of people. I mean, in particular, uh, Ted Nelson's book on Dream Machines mm-hmm. intentionally uh, mimicked the style of, of, of Stuart Brand's book. And uh, Or, for example, Alan Kay, the computer scientist at Xerox Park, who invented the first you know, truly modern experimental personal computer, one day... Um, he walked into the Xerox corporate library with a copy of um, a Whole Earth Catalog and told the librarian to buy all the books that were in the catalog. It was that influential. Your book is cut, populated by a whole bunch of really interesting people like uh, Brand and, uh, and Alan Kay. And one of the things that intrigues me about uh, both those guys is, I mean, they're not, you know, your archetypical hippie freaks. They, they, they exist somewhere on a boundary line uh, between that kind of archetype and, and uh, uh, an ability to expand out and encompass uh, a whole lot of other types of worlds, including the, uh, the mainstream world. Um, how much is the uh, computer counterculture more like a hybrid of the mainstream and counterculture than, say, uh, I know, the Yippies or, or something like that. God, there were all these threads. It's hard for me to sort that out. It's, there were all these threads. And, for example, Stuart. I mean, Stuart is such a mix. I mean, you can't pin him down. I mean, he's very conservative. Right. He's very radical in other ways. Yeah. What I, you know, when you mentioned both um, Kay and Brand, I mentioned them too. What set them apart, I think, is they were amongst the first people and this is what sets the West Coast apart from the East Coast, to really understand that computing was going to be a media. That mm-hmm. It was a media. It wasn't a calculation tool. It was this universal media machine that they hadn't seen before. And that was what they grasped. You know, Stuart Brand was the one who coined the term personal computer. He was the first one to use it in print, which is really quite striking. Was that in the Rolling Stone article? or was After that it. It was that? in the book. So he wrote the article. And the, the, say a little about that. Uh, very so, famous, yeah. uh, potent 1972 uh, yeah, article. A little bit of the history. Um, you know, Stuart had uh, gotten out of the military. He'd been a Stanford biology student. He came back to Stanford to become a photographer. And he was hanging out around the Stanford campus and in the early 60s. He was taken over to the computing center, and he saw these guys playing Space War. Space War was the first video game. It had been created by the MIT hackers, and it had been carried by the hackers when they came out to work for John McCarthy at the Stanford AI lab. So he saw these kids playing this this game, and it just it, it really stuck with him because here were these people having this out-of-body experience. And what he had discovered was cyberspace. He didn't know it was cyberspace at that right. point, but he was the first one to really sort of see cyberspace. So then in the 70s, after he quit doing the whole Earth catalog, he decides to become a writer, and he writes this article for the Rolling Stone. It was called Space War, um, Life and Symbolic Death Amongst the Computer Bombs. And he really was the first person to get it, the first person to see that there was something significant going on and try to interpret it to a larger audience. And that article was tremendously influential. And it created a, a great deal of consternation also at uh, Xerox. Oh, Xerox. Talk a little totally about the, uh, the, the relationship there between Xerox and Xerox Park and, yeah. and how uh, uh, they came to uh, get annoyed uh, uh, well, by this. Well, the reason he got into Xerox Park was because he was a friend of this man by the name of Bill English, who had come from Doug Engelbart's group at SRI to work at Xerox Park, where he was developing next generation technology. Bill English had been involved in the whole Earth catalog, so he invited him in without any of the corporate suits knowing. And then the article appeared, and this was not the image that that Xerox wanted. I mean, Xerox was trying to build the technology of the future for corporate America, and here they have this, this, you know, just outrageous article in in the Rolling Stone that argues that, let's see, how does it begin? Uh, Ready or not, computers are coming to the people, and it's probably the best thing since psychedelic drugs or something like that. It was a great lead. Right, Um, right. So not exactly Xerox's uh, (laughs) message. (laughs) Yeah, and so they shut, I mean, they shut down access tremendously. The park became much secretive, more secretive after that. And, of course, Xerox, the the suits of Xerox really proved to be uh, some of the biggest jerks Uh in the uh, history of the 20th century. They famously blew their lead in development of the PC, in particular the word processor, a particularly disastrous uh, case of the suits not listening to the freaks. Um, how how much of that do you come across uh, in the context of investing of of doing your book? Is that a, a single case, or are there other other cases? Well, you know, it was it was it was almost broader than that. I mean, I think that that, that w- the way you frame it is true. But I was sort of looking at it from the point of view of people who are in one technology paradigm almost always miss the next one. Yeah, that's true. And that's that was true. that was really the case with the East Coast computing culture. They all had access to big computers. They didn't get these small microprocessor-based machines. They thought they were toys. I want to say something about that. I read your book. I called my brother, who was in 
1955. It, it, he did part of um, what's that game you just said? Oh, so he did part of uh, Space yeah, War? and Space he War. knew McCarthy and he knew all these people. And I called him up. I said, "You have to go get this book." And he was so excited. So then I talked to him today after he read the book, and I said, "Well, how come you missed this whole thing in certain ways?" And it. A long conversation boiled down to the fact that, like you just said, he never saw the computer as a communications uh, thing. And, and one of the things he did, for example, was put terminals on Wall Street and the bond houses before that even existed. So they had, and he was East Coast, MIT, all that. He had, I guess, back then, and I'm fascinated with California, and your book that in the early 60s all of these individuals interacted and we really don't know a lot about them I mean we know more about from the 70s on so it, yeah. it was just fascinating but apparently on the East Coast like you said they just didn't get that it was a medium it was a communications device it was every they didn't understand that you could digitize everything these cultural and that's shifts what's happen. so uh, exciting and so reading your book I felt like well 1970 that's not even interesting anymore <laughs> it was those first experiments and exploring the potential and the other thing that was interesting was that Engelbart and a couple others really saw the whole thing including the internet and even more than we have today they saw that already in 1961 on. and, two. and so I think your book is a tremendous value to lay all that out. So I have a little question about that. Did you, all those anecdotes, did you have those in your notes or did you interview people or use so some place you meant Let me tell you where the yeah. book came from because the stories were really important. That's why I did it. Right. Um, I was invited to a dinner in 1999 on a Sausalito houseboat, which was held by a small group of people who had worked for Doug Engelbart. And mm -hmm. there were... The Duvalls, Bill and Ann Duvall, who worked for him, and Roberta and Bill English, who worked for him, and Ted Nelson uh, was there, too. And they had a bottle of wine or two, and they began telling all these stories. And I've been covering the computer industry for a long time, right. and I just hadn't heard any of these stories. And I came out afterwards, and I said, God, somebody's got to, you know, somebody's got to interview right. these people, right. get the, the stories. And then I realized that unless I did it, nobody else was going to do it. So there's kind of a uh, East Coast, West Coast thing going on in early computer culture, and the, the, the whole uh, sort of hip environment of the West Coast seems to uh, penetrate and saturate, and uh, how much of this is a historical accident? I mean, do you think there could have been some great genius on the East Coast who might have... God, that's, an, that's a really interesting question. I think the historical accident was the intersection of all of these things. I have sort of a sociological take on it. I mean, it wasn't... It wasn't sufficient that there was the technology. It wasn't su sufficient there was a counterculture. It wasn't sufficient that there was this anti-war protest. Right. They all had to come together at one place at one time. I mean, I really believe that, that those things were all necessary components of what happened. It really all did have to, to, to feed in. And, I mean, it, it just continued uh, uh, to have that kind of um, uh, sensibility and vibe to it. I mean, all through computer culture, there, there's always been that stream. And uh, perhaps if it hadn't been set up that way at the beginning, you know, the, the, the hipsters from uh, uh, everything from, you know, 90s cyberpunk to open source to... Uh, podcasting to what have you might not have been as inclined to uh, move in this direction. Well, it was certainly the roots. I mean, you can draw a direct line from Fred Moore, who started the Homebrew Club. I was just going to ask so that, I mean, I think he should be the patron saint of the modern open source movement, which is now spread beyond computing to all the digital media that we have. And, and you know, that was that was there. It was with the hackers at MIT, and then it was brought with the hack by the hackers from MIT and with the counterculture value set around um, around Menlo Park and came together at the Homebrew Computer Club in 1975. Right, with Lee Feldstein. Fred Moore is really the, the like real hardcore, authentic, like radical dude in your book right from the start. I mean, he, he uh, really struggles with conscience and, and uh, is very involved with po politics and pacifism. Th yeah. Tell people a little bit about his trajectory because he's there through the whole yeah, and story. I sort of wanted to make it that way. I mean, what struck me about Fred Moore, who died in a in a car accident oh. in 1997, no doubt. and what was so striking is that there was not even an obituary of him when he died. Oh. And he did two things that are, I think are really significant. Um, one was that he staged a sit-in, one-man protest on the steps of Sproul Plaza in the fall of 1959 as a freshman against mandatory ROTC. 
and it lasted about two days. People didn't know about political protests at this point, and his dad came out from the East Coast and took him home. And, but it had this impact. What happened was the people who would, like, four years later start the free speech movement saw Fred Moore make an individual stand of conscience, and it had an impact. They realized that one person could make a difference. So he goes on, and he goes to jail. He's a draft resistor, and comes back to the West Coast in the early 1970s. And he's hanging out around the Whole Earth Truck Store. And uh, he's running this project called the Information Network. And his whole thing is bringing different community groups together. And he's doing it on a three by five file cord box. You know, he's keeping these. I mean, he's, but he's a computer hobbyist. He's discovered computers and he realizes if he has a database, it'll be much more efficient. So he has this hunger to have his own computer, but he's too poor to have access to a computer. So he gets this idea. He's hanging out around the People's Computer Company in, Mount, in Menlo Park, and he gets this idea that we can have a hobbyist group and we can all make our own computers. And then the idea just gets a little out of hand. I mean, out of the Homebrew Computer Club came more than two dozen companies, including Apple Computer and another, a number of other companies that sort of transformed into this modern personal computer industry. So he had a huge impact. And there's this, this funny section uh, where he winds up uh, being given a bunch of money. Um, yeah. And he is, yeah, that's you know, his famous and moment. he's trying to, uh, you know, it's it's, it's this almost biblical it. situation. Or where Frodo. Is, it's like, uh, it's like yeah, Frodo. Frodo in the ring. The, yeah. the, the, the money, yeah. he actually takes this money that Stuart Brand gives away. And, they, you know, there's this famous party at the Exploratorium yeah. in San Francisco called the Demise Party. And it goes all night and people trying to figure out what to do with $20,000. And there are all these ideas. And in the end, Fred Moore is going around all night saying, we can't decide this by vote. We have to decide this by a consensus. This is, we can build a community here. So they give the money to Fred. Okay. And then Fred freaks out because, you know, money to him is the root of all human problems. So he takes the money home and he buries it in the backyard, which is just this w wild thing. And so some of the activists in the city find out about it and they come down and they force him to unbury they, the money. They shake him down, which is a very <laughs> kind of early 70s left wing kind of thing. They yeah. did, yeah. Yeah. Very amazing stuff. Hey, Fred, uh, Fred Moore's whole conscience about war is sort of in some ways contrasted with um, the general vibe around uh, computers and the military in the, in the sense that there was this really uh, very straightforward oppositional thing going on within the counterculture where the counterculture was against the war machine. But in computer culture, right from the start, you have a lot more mixing it up and a lot more... Uh, complexity in terms of people trying to uh, figure out what their relationships are to either on the one hand, you know, the Pentagon is giving us all this great funding and ARPA is really, you know, created uh, to a great extent by the Pentagon. And on the other hand, we feel sympathy for it. And, and this just goes on and on and on. I mean, you know, you know, uh, you know, hippie hackers who were uh, worked on Star Wars and joked about right. it being uh, right. a welfare system for hackers because right. you weren't really doing anything, uh, but you were getting tons of money. And this is, has gone all through computer culture and where you see, you know, in the same room uh, at parties, you see some of the most radical like left wing people in the country hanging out with some people who work with the military and don't even give it a second thought. That's very true. And it's a very interesting culture that way. How, did, how do you... Uh, uh, well, where I saw it at that time, I mean, you're looking at, you're talking about a little bit more modern... I'm, yeah, thing, I'm but, saying that, that this but, kind of dichotomy or integration really uh, what, uh, what runs I, throughout. What I ran into time and time again in looking at these two laboratories, you know, the Stanford AI Lab and the Augment Research Lab uh, that was Engelbart's, was a lot of the young men, the bright young men who showed up there, were there because they wanted to avoid the Vietnam War. Right. I mean, that was the one of the easiest ways. If you weren't a student, um, you could get a Pentagon deferment for doing work at this laboratory that was funded by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So it was right. this great gig. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can name the people. I mean, Whit Diffie comes to mind. Oh, um, Whitfield you know, Diffie, sure. So, uh, right. Whit Diffie is the father of modern uh, public key cryptography. Sure. And, uh, you know, he was very straightforward about it. This was just a way so he wouldn't have to go go into the military. You know, right. Like dozens of other people who were there for the same reason. So, so it's a, yeah, it's a really sort of what would have happened if these people didn't have to go to these labs? Would they have done other things? I think they, many of them might probably have done that. Uh, and I wonder uh, at what level does any of this penetrate the um, uh, sensibility of the establishment. I mean, at, at what point 
do people, did people who are associated with the Pentagon and with, with uh, uh, political power say to themselves, hey, some of these people who are alternative-minded and take psychedelic drugs are actually not goofy hippies, but are actually valuable and take advantage people. of it. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, you know, it's... It, There's it, a little bit, but I think it's a certain class of people inside the military who has right. that worldview. And, for example, the guy running uh, DARPA right now, a man by the name of T Tony Tether, has a very different view, and he's moved all the funding, moved a lot of the funding away from the universities and moved it into classified mm -hmm. and more traditional defense contractor kind of sphere. So there's a change right. in DARPA. Well, Isn't that's a reaction to 9-11 mostly, or I mean the whole tendency towards secrecy in the Bush administration. I think it's, yeah, I think it's broader than 9-11. Yeah. I think it's the Bush, the, the Bush, yeah. you know, administration has this very Power different view. Power centralization. Yeah, and they've sort of moved back to the Southern Rim strategy that was um, probably closer to the Nixon administration. I have a different question. In uh, your book, you name all these things in 1960 or 61 that are still the issues of computing like open source versus proprietary um, you talk about early video game I mean issues. it's unbelievable then I read about John Chowning who started with um, music and Wanted. instrumentation and all of these so I'm reading this and I'm thinking oh 1960 too bad we had to put in three decades in between we couldn't <laughs> just jump to today do you want to talk about that? Well, yeah, I think that it, it takes a long time for advanced technologies to be assimilated. None of this is a straight line. The mouse, for example, really took two decades mm -hmm. to become a widely used tool, maybe even two and a half decades before right. you know, it became part of Windows. And you can look at lots of technologies like that. I mean, there's some people who argue that that's accelerating now, but I think at that time, it really took, uh, the cultures didn't quickly absorb new technologies, and I don't understand that, but I think I've seen it happen over and over again, so I'm not surprised by it. I kind of, I always liked the period of 1910 in Europe when Einstein and Mahler and uh, Niels Bohr, there was somebody in every single field, Madame Curie, mm -hmm. doing phenomenal things, and then I say, well, the war interrupted that, cut off all those people, and I always felt we never got back to the level we were in 1910 until maybe 1975. And so then, when I'm reading your book now, I'm thought, oh shit, every time, you know, we're going to have to go through this enormous. I mean, I would like it if it were accelerating, like Bill Joy says, but. Yeah, it, I I don't have a, a, a good explanation for why that mechanism, but I certainly observed it. W weren't you surprised that all those things had occurred so early? Um, those those sort of intrinsic, like it's like the user, it's it was power versus ease of use. That's to me today the, the same debate, right? The biggest problem with computers. Yeah, yeah, and, and but but they were learning for the first. Those things were being learned for the first time. Then I mean, it was it was really a green field. People were starting right from scratch, and it made two things. It, it was really hard because there wasn't a lot of computer power, and on the other side, you know, there were lots of things to discover. It was really easy to do something new because nothing had been done at all. It's sort of like DNA. I mean, the, the fully realized human or the uh, fully realized computer culture is implicit right from the start, and all those issues are all there right from the start, and then you know, you see it, you see it form. You could definitely say form that. a body. One more question, and uh, what about yourself, uh, John Markoff? You were how old in the, uh, say, 1968? Oh, well, I was a college student. I started college in 67. I grew up in Palo Alto, actually. Right. But I went to school up in the Northwest. But I'd come back all the time. Right. And actually, when they installed that Space War game, they called it Galaxy Game. They didn't call right. it Space War at Stanford. I walked in, and that was my first... That was the first time I'd ever seen an interactive display, and it blew my mind. Did you love it? You, you well, I that? loved that. Yeah. That had an impact on me. And then the other thing that had a huge impact is I, I became a friend of one of the Alto developers. Hmm. And in 19, I guess this was later, and I, my introduction to modern computing was when I saw an Alto, this first PC, and that was in 1979. And yeah. that blew my mind the yeah, second time. Yeah, a lot time. of people were blown away by yeah. that. Um, did you uh, feel, uh, were you reassociated with uh, what we'd call the counterculture, new left, psychedelic, oh, very much all of that? All of the above. Um, I was an activist more than I was right. in the counterculture, although, you know, I sort of liked what uh, Abby and Jerry were doing. Right. Um, you know, I went to a lot of dead concerts. I grew right. up at the Fillmore, more or less. So, you know, you can figure out where I came from. Right. <laughs> we are everywhere.
Sherry, you have, you have time, uh, one, one more, more one more question. In your book, you talk about some really early efforts to make programs for the computer to work with mental health patients. Oh yeah, called Eliza and Parry. Parry was for uh, paranoid you know, schizophrenic. Paranoid, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, did that kind of thing ever go anywhere? I thought um, that was astounding. Yeah, um, I mean that was that work has played out into modern um, voice recognition technology in a big way. I mean now if you pick up. Um, you know, a, your cell phone, and you talk to the operator, or your regular phone. You talk to, you often talk to a robot instead of a human being. I thought you were going to say you talk to a paranoid. <laughs> well, you may talk to a paranoid <laughs> robot. <laughs> yeah, both. That's <laughs> clearly possible. But that was the, oh. where that research led. So okay. it did. I don't know about mental health. Right. Actually, okay. that's the other.